podcast where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Joey Miller, senior technician here at LensRentals.com. I'm Roger Sakala, senior senior assistant at LensRentals.com. Slash owner slash curmudgeon, whatever. Curmudgeon mostly. Yeah. We're going to talk about wedding gear today. A good curmudgeon topic. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about... How do you get into wedding photography if you haven't started at all, real briefly? I think the best way to do it is to find another local wedding photographer and second shoot for them. I think that's the best way. Yeah, you're probably going to start off just kind of schlepping for them, carrying all their stuff around, putting lights up. But eventually, you, they, you know, they'll probably need you to shoot some stuff. Uh, and that is the best way to get your feet wet. Because then you know, one, you're with a working photographer who's done this before. So you're getting to watch them do what they do mm -hmm. and you can see what works and what doesn't and the things that you're going to need to do when you're in charge and that that's the biggest thing start off seconding and do that for a, a while i'd also add do it with more than one photographer absolutely uh two three four whatever you can get because if you just do one photographer five times you're going to learn to do what he does and have stuff that looks like his or her stuff right Joey, quickly, when you're looking for that second shooter job, uh, I think sometimes people think they're going to just, you know, carry the gear around. Something to talk to with the primary shooter as to what you're going to be doing. So what do you tell the primary shooter when you're negotiating that deal? Every, every primary photographer will have different um, requirements for their second shooters. Um, but for the most part, at least in my experience, the, the four or five that I've worked for, Usually they require, you know, certain types of gear or certain, like you, you have to shoot raw or shoot JPEG, whatever they want. Uh, this, this is all stuff you should outline before you start shooting with them. Um, also negotiate a fee that you feel is appropriate. Most of the time it's just going to be backup stuff. Like you're going to be carrying stuff around. You're going to be helping set up lights. You're going to be helping crowd control. Uh, making sure that that checklist that you guys worked on with the bride beforehand is all complete, uh, and then still getting at least some usable photos, especially when it comes to reception time. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, during the ceremony, maybe you're in the balcony while they're down closer, so you're getting two different angles. Um, it's just all things you should be prepared for. Okay. At some point, people are going to go out and shoot their first wedding. They're going to be worried about what equipment do I need. So let's talk a little bit about what equipment do you need. Obviously, everybody needs to shoot a given brand of camera, right? To do absolutely. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> not. Nope. Um, I've seen weddings shot with every brand. I assume you have too. I have shot weddings with every brand. Even Pentax? Not Pentax. Uh, why not Pentax, Joey? Pentax is the worst. <laughs> and you three Pentax shooters out there that hate me for this right now, I don't even care. I don't even care. Let the record show I shot Pentax for the last year or so, although I didn't shoot any weddings with it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But let's talk about what's the essential stuff you're going to have to have for a wedding because it's when I get calls, and I'm sure when you get calls from people going, I'm going to do a wedding and I want this lens, and you want to just kind of go, wait, do you have A, B, C, D? And so what do you start with your checklist? Of? What are the things you have to have to even consider doing a wedding? Right. Uh, I think some sort of interchangeable lens camera is the best idea. Right. Um, all current generation DSLRs and mirrorless bodies will do just fine at 90% of a wedding. Mm -hmm. um, from like entry level Canon SL3 all the way up to, you know, the big stuff. Uh, and all the Sony bodies, all the even like the new Canon mirrorless and the new Nikon mirrorless, those are all fine for most of what you want to do. Uh, they're good enough in low light. Autofocus will work fast enough for most things, depending on your style of shooting. Because remember, people have been shooting weddings for decades and decades and decades, long before you had all the fancy bells and whistles of modern electronics. People used to f manually focus a bride walking down the aisle. It can be done. It has been done very successfully for a long time. So you don't 
have to have the latest and greatest. Right. It just helps. Like, it makes it easier for you, so you don't have to think about it so much. You can do a whole lot of weddings, especially the ceremony, with spot focusing. Right. I shot an entire wedding on a, a 1960s press camera with Polaroid film, fully manual, exposure and focus. It's a rangefinder that you can barely see the spot. Mm -hmm. And I delivered 100 images at the end of the night, and that client was extremely happy. Because she knew what she was getting. Like, she paid for that. But I got all the, I got all the important images and then some. Okay, but back to basics. So, any camera is fine. How many cameras should you have? You should always at least have two. Absolutely. Backups and on backups on backups. Backup cards, backup bodies. Uh, maybe not two copies of every lens, but you should have lenses that can cover your bases. I think you, ha you should have at least two lenses for each camera. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree and, with that. Two batteries minimum, probably four for each camera. Depending on the cars, camera, especially yeah. like Sony stuff, yeah, you, you should probably bring four. five batteries to a wedding. Point. Any camera you want. Really, most of the time, within reason, any lens you want. Any uh, lens you want, yeah, especially any prime should be fine. Yeah. Um, when it comes to zooms, there are industry standards. All the 2.8 zooms are, are what people use because... Weddings can be demanding, especially the reception, especially in like tiny, cramped, dark churches. Your faster zooms are kind of come in handy for that. Um, but you know, if you, you're shooting a beach wedding, you're shooting an outdoor wedding, you're shooting a daytime wedding, you can literally use anything. Yeah. You get to the candlelit ceremonies, that 18 to 200 f5.6 zoom is probably that not going to be a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's one of the other things we need to talk about when you're selecting your lenses. Absolutely imperative that before the wedding, you've seen the venue and you know where you're going to be allowed to shoot from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, a good walkthrough of the venue, if you're not familiar with it, is great. Most venues will allow you to come in anytime ahead of time just to see it. Because, I mean, they're showing it to brides and grooms, too. Like, mm -hmm. There's no reason a photographer can't come in and check it out, too. But you have to ask for some rules. Sometimes certain churches won't let you up in the front. Right. A lot of churches make you shoot either from the balcony if they have one or behind the last pew that someone's seated on. Hardly any church I know ever allows you to use flash. So right. um, save your flash for the for the reception. Yeah. And and if you're in that situation not using flash, check where your lighting's coming from because I've seen some weddings that were shot entirely backlit and it was not good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's rough. That's really rough. <laughs> okay, now, you can shoot it with any camera. You can shoot it with any lens. You need a lot of backup. Let's talk for a minute about the really cool lenses, yeah. the fast primes, the stuff that makes your wedding photography pop out, at least in certain pictures. And again, you don't have to have 200 great images, but if you got four or five, that usually is enough. That's all you need. Yeah. So what lenses do you reach for for your special lenses? Uh, 200 F2. Yeah. It's the lens. Oh. The uh, Sony Pentax 200 F2s, I think it was a little Does hard Sony to Does Sony even make one? No. <laughs> they do make adapters, so it's they possible do. to do. They do. Um, but they're basically two of them. Well, three of them now, aren't they? Three of them now. Yeah, Fuji um, has one. Right? There's the Canon one, the, Fu the Sony one, or sorry, Nikon. Canon one, the Nikon one, and that Fuji one, which is great. It's a really good lens. I love that lens. Yeah. I love that lens. I don't think there are Fuji to Sony adapters out there, though. No, so. no. Mm -hmm. Basically, Canon and Nikon. I'm a big fan of that, too, for a couple of reasons. One is the length can be real useful. Mm -hmm. The depth of field can be awesome. Yes. You can always stop it down. And it gives you that ability to get out of everybody's face and get more natural shots. Yeah. Uh, compression is, you know, um, very, very flattering at 200. Absolutely. Uh, and your backgrounds will never be more out of focus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of flattering compression and things like that, you want to make a comment about your 16 to 35 wide angle zooms? Oh, God. Um, question I get a lot is this wedding party is huge. How do I get everyone in the shot? I need a super wide angle lens. And the thing I, I have to, the thing I harp on the most is you're not going to want to use anything wider than about 35 millimeters in full frame. Because if you go wider than that, perspective distortion kicks in. And people on the edges start to stretch. And who's on the edge of the photos? Mother-in-law generally? Almost always. Yeah. <laughs> and she's probably helping pay for you. So yeah, exactly. you want her to look real good. 
Yeah, I think I think if you can back up, there are times you can't back up. Sometimes you can angle that shot. Right. I think the other thing I'd throw out, if you have to use that wide angle zoom, take a few minutes to learn the curvature of the field in that because they all have a curved field. Yeah, and of course, you know, if you just want a super wide for effect for like an environmental portrait, that's right. a different yeah, thing because totally you're going to be – you're going to have your couple or the, the small group of people closer to the middle where that's not going to be a, not going to be a problem. Good point. So just use it to good effect. What about wide primes other than the 200 to F2, which I consider a wide prime? Uh, <laughs> uh, my other favorite prime, um, the Sigma 105. It's like the mini 200. Mm -hmm. But if we want to go wider than that, I always take a 35 and an 85. And usually something super wide, like uh, that Sigma 1418 is great. Okay. Um, that's a fun one to just do weird shots with. Yeah, and so ice has a decent uh, 15. Yeah, 15 is nice. Yeah, but again, field curvature there. You almost have to kind of curve your wedding party if you want to get them all in focus uh, yeah. on those big group shots. Yeah, I, th I think the, the biggest thing with this lens selection question um, the wedding industry is very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. So you've got to figure out how to make yourself stand out. Uh, and one, one easy way is to use stuff that people don't use. But you have to use it effectively. So that there's the rub. Like you can't just go shoot a whole wedding on a fisheye. I mean, you could. And I'm sure someone would pay you to do that. Um, Talk about mother-in-law at the end of the picture not being happy. <laughs> uh, Fisheye is a, is a lens I get asked a lot about for weddings. People want that fisheye look for... Uh, there's the, the typical overhead shot of, like, all the bridesmaids looking up with their flowers or whatever. And, like, those are cute. Those are one-off images you're probably going to do once a wedding. Maybe you don't want to buy that lens because you're only going to use it mm -hmm. every once in a while. Yeah. I, I've seen a couple of... Both fisheye and macros used a great effect in weddings. Yeah. And... Uh, Rings and bouquets really are interesting in either of the two. Yeah, I agree. Um, you, you want to make that quarter carat ring look good, get a big old macro. It, yeah. it'll, it'll show some impressive stuff. Oh, yeah. And macro lenses are another great one. Um, they double as good portrait lenses, too. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on a budget and you, you just don't want to buy a macro, get an extension tube for your 85 or your 50. Good point. It works just as well. It's way cheaper. Yeah. I think one other lens we hadn't mentioned that I'll throw in because most people really don't want to handle a 200 F2. The, the 135 F1.8s and F2s, those are really good lenses those for Those are weddings spectacular. Too. And uh, they, the, you know, there's a, been a rash of them come out lately, Sony's and uh, mm -hmm. Sigma's. They're really, really good. And I would say average, like medium-sized church, if you're shooting with a 70 to 200, you're probably going to be around 130, 130 to 150 anyway. Mm -hmm. So that 135 F2, F1.8, that gives you an extra stop, and you're about where you want to be. And the Zoom people can say what they want. It's not a prime. The look is different. And when we go back to that thing of I want some special-looking shots, I can go through a wedding you know, portfolio and pick out the prime lens shots. It's Absolutely. Easy. F2 looks like F2. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way it is. It definitely is impressive. All right, we've kind of talked about cameras, and we've talked about lenses. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about other stuff you need if you're going to really pull off a good wedding other than, you know, let's say it's lit by spotlights and the sun and everything. <laughs> Lighting for weddings, I think, is really where I, I look and separate the... I can do weddings from I am a wedding photographer. Right, Uh I think a lot of starting out photographers get stuck in the trap of, I'm a natural light photographer. And what that almost always means is, I don't know shit about lighting. <laughs> so I don't know how to use these lights, and they scare the crap out of me. Right. Uh, and that's fine. Like, that's, that's totally fine if that's the way you want to mask it. Or if that's just really what you like to do, then own that title. Uh, but... Yeah, like you said, an, a, the easiest, another easy way to set yourself apart from the, the crowd is to learn lighting and get real good at it. Yeah. And I think most people, I think, they're pretty comfortable with bouncing an on-camera strobe. Yeah, that's the easiest way to start. Get a but speed light and bounce it. To be decent, you probably have to at least be comfortable slaving some strobes, do you think? 
Uh, I think it's uh, the next important step is getting that, that flash off camera. Yeah. Especially reception shots, I think, because if you're walking through flashing everybody. You it's the, real distracting. Yeah, and they don't like you. Yeah. If the flashes are set up at the corners of the dance floor, you almost it, don't get blamed. Right. It kind of blends in with, like, whatever the band's lights are using. Yeah. Um, that, that's a, cross-lighting a dance floor is a nice, effective way to get good dynamic shots. Mm-hmm. Um, good cross-lighting always looks kind of nice. Yeah. So. And, and you can do... Not necessarily skillful flash capabilities, but just thoughtfulness. I've seen some amazingly good shots where somebody put the flash on a stand outside a window, mm-hmm. and the bride getting dressed looks like she's spotlighted in a sunbeam and yeah, stuff like perfect. that. There's all kinds of things you can do with flash that don't require you to be particularly flash skillful, Yeah, just to have some. Yeah, the, the greatest part about using a flash is you're completely in control of that light. Mm-hmm. You don't have to rely on where the sun is that day or the terrible fluorescent overhead lighting in the, the cave of a bride's room. Like, And that's a real important point for people watching shutter speeds when they're doing weddings under fluorescent oh, lights. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, being mindful of all the lighting in the room is, is, is key because... Fluorescent lighting, uh, any kind of like metal vapor lighting, um, even some LED lighting will cycle. And if mm-hmm. you're not shooting at the right shutter speeds, you'll get weird banding stuff happening, especially with mirrorless cameras uh, in silent shutter modes. Oh, good point, good point. And those weird banding things, I consider myself really pretty skillful in post-processing. Banding is hard to get rid of. It's real hard because it's... It's it, time-consuming. It's time-consuming, and it's not just, like, hard bands. It's, like, there's gradients between them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's weird color shifts that can't always be compensated for. Um, best best practice is to shoot at 60th or slower to just avoid it altogether. Yeah. Some cameras have flicker reduction. Um, Nikon started doing that a while back. Canon started doing it. Um, I think the newer Sonys do it, too. Uh, I think the Fuji X-T3 does it. Flicker reduction can help. Um, it's not 100%. Uh, and it may give you an extra stop or so on your shutter speed. Uh, right. Like you might be able to pull off one 125th or maybe one 250th, but it's, you know, it's yeah. not perfect. And I think that's uh, the whole lighting thing. I, I think we make the point of a lot of people think of lighting as I need this to get enough light. And really, the good use of lighting is to compensate for bad lighting. Yes. Even though there may be enough of it, it may be poor quality for effects, which can be really important. And in some cases, if you just are strobe uh, incompetent, get some continuous lights. The newer LED right. systems are light. They're pretty transportable. And it will get you enough light that is not flickering. Right. And, you know, if, if strobes and lighting really is not your thing, Consider, instead of saying natural light photographer, you're a photojournalist. I totally agree. So we've got some lights. we got uh, a decent set of lenses. We've got spare memory cards, spare cameras, spare batteries. Let's take a little break, regroup a bit, and then we'll come back and talk about things that you need to avoid and uh, maybe share some of the things we have done wrong that we wish we had a chance to do over. Because weddings mean no chance to do over. Hi, I'm Ryan Hill. This is a spotlight on Sam Leathers, one of our senior video technicians. Uh, Sam, what do you do here at Lynch Reynolds? I work in sort of the higher end video department, and that means I work with two other people um, and a smaller crew, and we take the bigger orders, usually more items, higher end gear, and we call the customers for compatibility questions. And it's a lot of making sure people's gimbal builds are going to work for them, and if the order seems like it's a lot of proprietary gear or maybe they're supplementing their own gear, make sure they have what they need to work with what they're renting from us. Um, so a lot of talking on the phone to people about their gear, trying to figure out what they do and what they're trying to do with the gear and make suggestions based off that. And uh, what did you do before you started working here? I did freelance photography. I played in a band and I worked two retail jobs. What sort of creative work do you do outside uh, of your job? I work in a studio on the side called Studio 143, based here in Memphis. 
and that is something me and a few of my friends have started. It's still a kind of a baby project right now, but we're trying to sort of establish our own production company and creative community in Memphis. So people that maybe don't have the funding or the means to make art can make a music video or, you know, just bring a lot of different kind of projects to life. But worked on a lot of music videos the last year or two. Um, we did two short films. We're gearing up for another one. And we've done a few documentary work. Um, projects for some people around Memphis and it's a lot of fun. I get to shoot all over town. I've gotten to go to the mountains and shoot in some cabins. Um, it's really fun. Uh, what would be your dream gig? What would you do if you didn't have to work at all? I mean really I'd love just to make my own movies. I would love to make a movie, a full production, you know. That's I think what I'm kind of working towards with 143 but that's kind of the goal is to make a, a feature. Yeah. What is the biggest challenge you face so far in shooting the shorts you've shot? The typical challenges that come with a small budget, trying to figure out the maximum amount of stuff you can get for the little amount of money that you have, um, that being locations, cameras, all that. And on top of that, probably time management, trying to fit everything in in such a short window of time because we all have full-time jobs that aren't this. So... We're working on mostly weekends. We took a week off to go to those cabins, but it's everyone's doing this on top of their working lives. Uh, what is your favorite piece of gear to shoot with? Or maybe not shoot with specifically, maybe even just what is your favorite piece of gear to use on a shoot? I'm a sucker for a good dolly shot, so I really like if we can get our hands on a good dolly. And camera-wise, it's, I'm not always able to get it because of budget and availability, but we got to shoot a music video with a Veracam, and I was a big fan of that camera. Just the ergonomics behind it and the way the footage looked and how it feels in your hand um, was really nice. Other than that, yeah, dollies are great. I really like um, a good shoulder mount, too. I like the Spike Jones in your face kind of mm -hmm. walking in the middle of the shots. Um, yeah, the Veracam is great for mm -hmm. that. It's heavy, so your shaky, what would be bad-looking handheld footage is mm -hmm. now good-looking handheld footage because it has so much weight to it. And uh, where can people find your work? I'm on Instagram. It's just Sam Leathers, and I have a website that's also samleathers.22slides.com because my domain name ran out. Very nice. And uh, Studio 143, is there a website for that? Yes. Um, Studio 143 is also studio143.com, and we're also on Instagram as Studio 143. All right. There will be links to all that in the show notes. Sam, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me, Ryan. My favorite story, though, is make sure you have transportation. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> we had a photographer who did not have transportation from the church to the reception. And no one would take him. <laughs> oh, my God. That's terrible. Uh, yeah, you got to think of all the possible things that can go yeah, wrong. Yeah, there's a lot of other little things I always keep in my bag for weddings. Uh, one is a flask of whiskey. Is that Some, for you or for others? Uh, often it ends up being for the mother of the bride. Ah, okay. Yeah, it really calms her nerves. That's come in handy many times. That's uh, nice. I also always carry uh, a little Swiss Army knife that has scissors, a nail file, two blades, and a pen. You never know when you need a pen, and that comes in handy all the time. Okay. Uh, tweezers, too. Um, I used to carry a sewing kit because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I personally and a lot of the, my favorite photographers that I've worked with all have the same philosophy. If you are showing up to a wedding to shoot it, it's a formal event. You should dress the part. So I always wear a suit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, there's levels of formality you can do. What I hate is seeing people show up uh, in a black polo and black chinos. like Looking like a roadie? Looking like a roadie. Like you're standing out like a sore thumb. Like, yeah, okay, maybe you've got a giant camera in front of your face too. But yeah. I don't know. I've always found it... One, it's, it's, it's nice. It's a little classy. It's like a little nod to the bride and groom, like, I respect your day. Uh, but also, if you look like a guest, you blend in with the guests, and sometimes that gets you better images because it gets you more access to things. Like, people aren't just like, oh. Like the buffet? Uh, yeah, that's worked, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buffet in the open bar. Uh -huh. um, that is my number one pet peeve, is seeing photographers and videographers show up to a wedding in not wedding 
clothes. <laughs> so we have to talk about the most dreaded of weddings, oh. the beach wedding. Oh, no. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Okay, so tips for the beach wedding. Don't let anything touch the sand. I often recommend changing bags. Somewhere you can change your lens inside a plastic bag instead of out in the right. open. Right, yeah. Uh, any kind of extra level of protection you can give uh, your gear with wind blowing, with sand in the wind. If you can change indoors, that's better. But if you have to change lenses while you're out on that beach, having a bag, you can put everything in, change it, and then take it out of the bag. That's the best idea. And a changing bag is no more than a big baggie or a garbage bag. Just something right, you yeah, you can grab a, a, you know, a cheap, hefty cinch sack from, yep. you know, you're under your sink. You can grab a laundry bag. Those work fine. Not not the mesh ones, like the, the solid ones. And, and we talked earlier about the super zoom not being the best wedding photographer's tool, but it can be used at the beach where there's lots of sunlight. It can be a really useful tool and avoid some of those lens changes. Yeah, especially if you're shooting mirrorless because you, ooh, if you get sand on your sensor. You've got dots on your image. Uh, you got dots on your image, and if it's blowing real hard, you could scratch the sensor. Like, it's just bad all around. And I, I think this is a good case where you go, you know, maybe more cameras because while inside you can do all the normal stuff you always do. Once it goes out to the beach, for me personally, I'd like my lenses on my cameras, and I'll change cameras to change lenses. Right. And on top of that, uh, if you do have multiple cameras with multiple lenses so you don't have to change anything, seal up everything with either gaff tape or plastic bags or something to keep the sand from getting in. Mm -hmm. As no matter how weather sealed you think your stuff is, it's probably not, not. going to hold up to that. The second thing that I've seen people do is kind of cave into the bride with, I want you over here. And you've got to make that explanation about sunlight and you can't overcome sunlight. Right. Be a boss. Yeah. Like they, do, you know more than they do. Yeah. Unless you happen to be photographing another photographer's wedding, and then yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but <unless laughs> then you, they should understand. Unless they're going to want you to take big bounce sheets or something else for lighting, you have to be able to say, if you want me over here, you're going to be nothing but a silhouette in every image. Are you okay with that? Right. Do what you know is right. Right. And stand your ground. And the images will show themselves to be worth it. Any other special wedding venues you can think of that present difficulties? Mm. I had one in a cave once, but I don't think that's very common. <laughs> I've done one on a boat before. That was weird. Um, is that a situation where IS makes a difference, or is everybody rocking pretty much at the same rate? Um, yeah, actually, it was uh, it was a river boat around sunset, so IS did actually come in handy. Okay. So, yeah. Or uh, VR, or whatever your yeah, brand has. Stabilization. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Something good. I'm usually not a big fan um, of that being necessary for most of the wedding shots, but it doesn't hurt. And if you're in the balcony or whatever, it can't right. uh, Well, and, you know, again, weddings will often push the boundaries of your gear. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the night goes on, those, some of those venues are dark. You need every little bit of help you can get sometimes. Right. So. Okay. Anything else you can think of? Because i got one more topic on weddings I want to throw out at you. Uh, I think that's all I can think of right now. Okay, how about the second assistant with the 3028? <laughs> I've been that guy. <laughs> it's pretty useful sometimes, especially when you've got a big venue. It is. Um, I have, I used to second shoot for this guy here locally for three or four years, and he loved having me because I work here. Mm -hmm. So there, some of the bigger churches around town, um, some of the really big churches, you are stuck in the balcony, and it was never a problem for us because I I would ask at the you know at the beginning of the week, so uh, where are we shooting this weekend? And he'd tell me I'd be like, oh okay, so I need a four hundred two eight for that. He's like, if you can bring it, I'm like, yeah, I, I can bring it. <laughs> I'm spoiled. I can take this stuff home for free. Uh, having a second shooter with access to stuff is great, mm -hmm. um, but having a second shooter strategically positioned with the right gear is always clutch. Yeah. As a primary shooter, that should be something you should be thinking about. And I think that's the perfect place for a second shooter because he's going to be here with the lens, with the camera, take pictures while the primary shooter can move around and do right. other things. Right, because it's easy to photograph, you know, the couple at the altar. That's mm -hmm. that's pretty easy. Like, you can just shoot a whole lot and then you'll get the images you need. Like, you'll, you'll get the, the exchanging of the rings and the exchanging of the vows and the kiss and everything. Um 
some of the more artsy shots you can't do from up there necessarily. No, but you can get some dramatic exit down the aisle pictures from the balcony. Oh, yeah. With a big oh, lens. Yeah. Or, you know, super wide from the top. Yeah. The, like the whole church. And well, that, that relief on the face of the bride and groom as they leave the altar, it, it can be mistaken for pure joy. <laughs> <laughs> they never look happier. <laughs> it's usually the well, part. I say that. I have seen some pretty unhappy brides coming back down the well, aisle. Well, okay. But as a rule, that's the happiest face you're going to see. Yes, the whole generally party. that is the happiest. Well, until they get drunk later. <laughs> That's the sloppy happy, not always the one they would have yeah. put on the <laughs> on the mantle in a twenty four by sixteen yeah. print. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, that's all I know about weddings. You got anything else you want to throw in? Oh this? yeah, um, horror stories. Yeah. Um, backups, backups, backups. Not just your gear, not just your cards, but the data on the cards. Um, the biggest nightmare scenario I ever personally experienced. Uh, oh. It was rough. I shot a wedding for a, a woman who was a friend of mine. Like, we weren't especially close, but friendly enough that I seen them out. Mm-hmm. So it was it was important to me to, like, get this right. Uh, very, very attractive couple. The venue was beautiful. Uh, all well done, all very well lit. Uh, and it was probably the most excited I had been about my wedding images to date. Um, Because everything just looked great. Everything clicked. Um, And I had like 1,500 images that were going to be spectacular to go through. Uh, Shot the wedding. The next week was WPPI. And I had to fly out to do our trade show booth out there. And I hadn't had a chance to edit anything. So I thought, I'll bring the cards with me. I'll edit these on the plane. Uh, it'll give me plenty of time to work on this stuff. We'll have some downtime while we're in Vegas. Well, I did a little bit of editing on the uh, plane. Well, let the record show I've seen you in Vegas and you do not have downtime. That so. is correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to the hotel. I got my stuff out. And that first night... Before I went to bed, I was like, ah, I'll look at these. I looked at them, put the cards on the nightstand. Next day, you know, went to the trade show, came back. Uh, I had forgotten to put the Do Not Disturb sign on my my hotel door. And so the maid service came in and cleaned up. And part of their cleaning up happened to be that they threw away my memory cards. <coughs> Couldn't, I, I, I have no other explanation other than that because... They were on the nightstand, and then they weren't. So they either stole them or they threw them away. Uh, I thought at first maybe they knocked them under the bed. They were not there. Um, I called the maid service. They had no idea. Uh, funny that they only took the cards when my computer was sitting out, too. But uh, anyway, I forgot to back them up. I had no backups, like none, oh, God. because... I don't know why. I have no idea why I didn't do it. I've done it every other time, and I've done it every other time since. And but yet you're here and alive. I'm alive. Uh, I came back from that. Uh, came back from that trip, and I called the bride, and I explained what happened. And she was she was upset, uh, but no kidding. <laughs> she wasn't as upset as I thought she was going to be. She actually invited me over for dinner the next night. With her husband. With her husband. Okay. So I had a, oh, it was, now that I think about it, I feel like maybe she was torturing me on purpose. (laughs) She was trying to be forgiven. But I I had, I refunded them. Um, It turns out there was a a good friend of mine at the wedding also photographing just for fun. So she got, she got a couple of hundred good images anyways for free. Um, but they were very gracious about it. You know, they, they were like, we understand. And I was like, well, I, you know, I'll, whatever kind of photos you want in the future, they're on me for the, forever. Uh, she has not taken me up on that. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Uh, so not only have extra memory cards, but back them up first and foremost. Back them up immediately. Yeah. Back them up immediately. If you can back them up on site with, like, a, a portable drive, that's even better. Yeah, the other thing I think that's... We see half of this sometimes, but stuff gets stolen. It gets stolen at weddings. Yes, it does. 
uh, memory cards in your bag are going to go away with your bag. So that might yes, be a thing you keep are. on your person, whether you keep a little wallet or something else. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's that's kind of critical. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's all we know. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Also, Pentax still sucks. Oh, my God. <laughs> Doesn't suck. It's really pretty good. That's just like your opinion, man. Yeah, well, just because I know how to work it, man. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals Podcast. If you have any questions or comments, let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. I leave with this quote by Mary Morantz. We need to start taking pictures of people and stop taking pictures of poses.